Hi there, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Mutiaba Conrad. I'm a lawyer by profession and also a private law tutor. And uh, basically today we are going to be looking at defenses. Uh, but however, before we start on our topic, I encourage you to subscribe, like and share my channel. And also very important that you turn on your notifications so that you're always able to get an update on the videos whenever and if they are released. And also students that are also interested in private uh, law tuto tutorials, uh, we can always make an arrangement and feel free to contact us. And this will also help you in terms of getting better grades and you'll also have a more understanding and detailed uh, discussion uh, with our experts. So basically today, uh, like I said, we're going to be looking at the topic of uh, uh, defenses. Uh, and these defenses basically we're going to look at are going to include insanity, self-defense, infancy, and automatism. In another video that I will release, I'll also be discussing another set of defenses that reduce uh, murder to manslaughter. But for today, we are mainly going to concentrate on those four defenses. Now, let's start right away uh, with our first defense, which is insanity. But however, before we even embark on these uh, different defenses, it's important to note the general rule, or rather the principle, that actually governs all these defenses. Okay, So please note, there is a principle governing defenses, and that principle was clearly laid down uh, by the Supreme Court in the case of Okelo, uh, Okidi versus Uganda. It's a Supreme Court criminal appeal number three of 1995. And that principle basically that governs all defenses is that um, is the requirement by court to investigate all possible defenses uh, even when they are not raised by the accused person as long as there is some evidence to suggest any defense. So here what we are trying to say is that if an accused person goes to court okay, and for them thinking that maybe the defense they have is insanity but unknown to them, maybe uh, the defense of self-defense would work, okay? So court has a duty to ensure that it actually evaluates, analyzes, and applies a defense if the defense actually falls on all fours. So if an accused person qualifies for a certain defense, okay, even when they don't raise it, court has a duty to ensure that it actually analyzes and where the defense applies, court always has the discretion and the powers to apply such a defense in favor of an accused person. So that is basically the principle you should not uh, pertaining to all defenses. Now, having laid down the principle governing defenses, let's now proceed to look at our first defense, which is insanity. Now, insanity is provided for under the law. I invite you to look at section 10 of the Penal Code Act, which presumes all persons to be sane. Okay. So section 10 is presuming that any human being walking at any given day is sane. Okay, They don't have any problem of the mind. That is what section 10 is saying. But section 11 is authoritative. It is actually section 11 that provides for the defense of insanity as a defense under the law. Now having looked at the law, let's now proceed to look at the definition of insanity and principle to rely on the defense. So we are going to define and also we look at the principle. If you're going to rely on the defense of insanity, what is the principle? Basically, the principle governing this defense of insanity was clearly laid down in the case of Manag uh, M. Natten's case. It's a case of 1843, 10 C and F, 200. And basically in this case, it was held that this is where the accused is laboring under the disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he or she was doing or to know that it was actually wrong. So here court was trying to say that the defense of insanity is raised by a person who at the time of the commission of the act was laboring under the disease of the mind. They were, the, 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 their mental faculties were not in the proper state, they were diseased, they were incapacitated mentally. And that at the time they actually committed the act for which they accused, they did not know what they were doing. Or if they knew what they were doing, they actually did not know 
that it is wrong. So let's now proceed to look at the burden. Uh, and the burden pertaining to the defense of insanity is that the burden to prove insanity on the accused is on a balance of probabilities. This is very important to note, very, very important. On the defense of uh, insanity, the burden on the accused is on a balance of probabilities. Here what we mean is that the accused only has to show on a balance of probabilities that they were actually insane, okay, and that they were not in their proper mental state. So they don't have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. No, it is only on a balance of probabilities. Now, having known that, let's proceed to look at the methods of proving insanity. How is insanity proved? Okay. Uh, the first is medical examination. So the, the accused will be medically examined and, uh, of course, a report will be generated, a medical report, to show her the state of their mental faculties. Secondly, examination of the behavior of the accused. So we'll also proceed to examine the behavior of the accused. Okay. This is very important. Uh, also, in the case of karaoke versus R, a case of uh, the citation is KLR, uh, page 164, court held that it is not always necessary to have evidence of a doctor if circumstances show that the accused was insane. Okay, so the, 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 the evidence of a doctor is not mandatory in all cases, but if there is overwhelming evidence to show that the accused was actually insane, then court can also act on its own observations or on such type of evidence. So basically that is it on the defense of insanity. Let's now proceed to look at the defense of self-defense. Now this defense is provided for by law and I encourage you to look at section 15 subsection of the Penal Code Act which provides for that defense or the defense um, of uh, the defense of uh, the, the, the defense that applies to, to persons. Now, important to note on this defense is that uh, uh, the defense allows one to use reasonable force in three circumstances. Okay, so you are allowed to use reasonable force in self-defense in three circumstances. The first circumstance is in self-defense, when you're defending your own self. Okay, thirdly, in preventing an attack on another person. So another person could be under attack. The law allows you to use reasonable force to ensure that you prevent that attack from being executed against another person. Then lastly, defense of property. So you can also use reasonable force to defend either your property or another person's property. This is allowed. Let's now look at the definition of self-defense. And uh, this is defined very clearly in the Black Laws Dictionary, 9th edition, page 1481, which uh, defines it as the use of force to protect oneself, one's family, or one's property from a real or threatened attack. So important to note, it should either be real or a threatened attack. Let's proceed to look at, um, at the aspect. Now we are going to interrogate those three circumstances slightly more in detail. And the first one we are going to look at is preventing an attack on another. What is the law? Look at the case of Ara versus Rose, a case of 1884, 15 COX 540. And in that case, the accused shot his father while he was attacking the accused's mother. He was acquitted, uh, uh, he was acquitted from murder on the grounds of self-defense. So I think we are seeing how the defense operates. Let's now proceed to look at the ingredients to self-defense. So if you're going to rely on self-defense, there are some ingredients that you must prove. And these were clearly laid down in the case of Uganda versus Kamiuka. It's a case of 2018, UGHCRD, page 140. And uh, basically here, court laid down those ingredients as follows. One, there must be an attack on the accused person or a close relative. Secondly, the accused must as a result, have reasonably believed that he was in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm. So the accused has to prove that if they are really going to rely on this defense. And then number three, the accused believed it necessary to use force to repel or to repel the attack. Then lastly, the force used by the accused must be 
such force as the accused believed on reasonable grounds to have been necessary to prevent or resist the attack. Okay, very important. Also, it's important to note, as was held in the case of Uganda versus Kamiuka, the case that I just gave you, a case of 2018, that in determining reasonable force, regard must be put to all circumstances of the case. So here what we mean is that if court is evaluating to draw itself to the conclusion that there was a reasonable force, it should consider all the circumstances that were surrounding the case and all the surrounding, uh, the surrounding different uh, scenarios and what was actually going on and the state at that material time. Then also of interest, I encourage you to look at the case of Beckford versus R. It's a case of 1988, SC, page 130. And basically here, uh, court held for Lord Griffith that it's not absolutely necessary that the accused be attacked first. Okay? A man to be attacked doesn't have to wait for his assailant to strike the first blow or fire the first shot. So here what court was saying, for you to, to defend yourself, you don't have to wait for the assailant or for the murderer or the killer or any person to first strike you first, then you also defend yourself. No, you can actually do a counter strike even before they come, then you attack them. But of course, this has to be applied within the circumstances. Assuming a thief comes to your home, but uh, you know he jumps over the fence and he's still in the compound. But you're in the house, maybe you're watching them through the window. You don't have to wait for them to come and break into your house and then you shoot them, okay? Or you attack them. No, you can actually aim from the window and then shoot the thief while he's standing in your compound late in the night. So this is what the judge was trying to say. Then lastly, let's look at the last aspect of defense of property, okay? Because remember we said that this defense also applies in situations of uh, defense of property, uh, defense of uh, another person, or you, or you personally defending yourself. So now we are looking at the defense uh, of property. And the authority there, I encourage you to look at the case of uh, Marwa versus R. It's a case of 1956 East Africa, page 660, where a court held that the use of force in defense of property um, is an acceptable defense to property, but the force must not be excessive. So this is really, really very important to note, yeah? that every time you, you want to successfully rely on the defense of self-defense, the force must be proportionate to the attack, okay? Very, very important. The moment you use excessive force in combating the assailant or in stopping the assailant, and you maybe cause extreme damage or maybe you kill the assailant, court will not allow such a defense where you used uh, extremely excessive force. So the force has to be are fairly proportionate. Then let's now proceed to our third defense, which is the defense of infancy. The defense of infancy from the word infant. So basically this defense is uh, provided for by law and uh, basically I encourage you to look at section 88 of the Children's Act and that section basically provides that the age of criminal responsibility is 12 years and above. What does this mean? This means that a child who is below 12 years, cannot be held criminally responsible for any offense that such a child commits. Okay, very, very important to note. Now, this, def this defense was well discussed and approved in a Ugandan case in Uguanda versus Yowansi, Birunji. It's a case of 1973, volume 1, Uganda Law Reports, page 47. Okay, very, very important. So children who are below 12 years, even if they commit a crime, you cannot hold them liable. So criminal liability starts from 12 years and above. Let's now proceed to look at our final defense in this video, and that is the defense of automatism. The defense of automatism. Now that defense was defined in the case of Bratty versus Attorney General for Northern Ireland. It's a case of 1963 SC, page 300 and 86 and basically this case defined automatism as a state of a person who though capable of action is not cautious of what he or she is doing.
Okay. In summary, automatism is unconscious involuntary action. Unconscious involuntary action. Okay. So here we are looking at a scenario where a person okay, is unconscious. They don't understand what they are doing. And therefore, they make certain actions involuntarily, unknown to them, or not them wanting to do such actions, but they end up doing them. And they are doing such actions in an unconscious manner, and they are not doing them in a voluntary manner. A good example is, for example, someone could sleepwalk, someone could wake up from their bed late in the night, Okay, then they move out of the house, then they go maybe, and then they kill someone. Okay, they are in a state of automatism. They are unconscious. They don't understand what they are doing. And the action of moving out and going to kill another person must have been involuntary. Okay, it must have been involuntary. And such a person must have been in an unconscious state. They did not understand what they were doing, the so-called sleepwalking. Okay, you wake up from your bed, you move out, you go, you do something, maybe you come back in your bed and sleep, and then the next morning you don't remember anything. You were unconscious, and the actions you did were involuntary. Okay, so basically that is what automatism is about. Um, Again, another authority of interest, look at the case of Attorney General's reference, number 2 of 1992. It's also reported in 1993, volume 3, uh, weekly law reports, page 982. And basically, in that case, court laid down uh, a number of, in, of interesting principles. It was stated in that case that there must be total loss of control. So if you're going to rely on the defense of automatism, there must be total loss of control of one's faculties if the defense is to be successfully raised. So the accused must have totally lost control of their mental faculties and that they were in a state of unconsciousness at that material time. Then secondly, medical evidence is used to prove that the accused did not know what he or she was doing. And when it's availed, the burden shifts back to prosecution to prove that the accused person actually intended to commit the offense. Very, very important to note. And every time you're evaluating this defense of automatism, you must evaluate it on the test, okay, of those two elements as were held out in the case of Attorney General's reference number two of 1992. Let's now proceed finally to look at the limitations to automatism. What are the limitations to automatism, circumstances where automatism will not apply? These limitations are provided for by law and they were clearly laid down in the case of Bratty versus Attorney General of Northern Ireland, the case of 1963 SC, page 386. And the first limitation is as follows. One, where automatism is caused by the disease of the mind. Okay where automatism is caused by the disease of the mind. Secondly, when it's caused by self-induced intoxication, okay, if it is caused by self-induced intoxication, even if it happens, that will be a limitation to its applicability. Number three, where it's caused by other factors other than drink or drugs, okay, then lastly, partial destruction of self-control partial destruction of self-control. So those three, rather those four, are the limitations to this defense, meaning that in such a scenario, uh, an accused person will be unsuccessful in relying on this defense. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I encourage you to like, subscribe, and share to my channel. Uh, and also that you ensure that every time I release something, you're able to get it. For students who need help, Please do not forget if you need private uh, tutorial sessions, uh, ensure that you contact us directly down in the description box. You'll be able to find our number. Thank you very much. We meet again. I'll be making you a video on other defenses that reduce, uh, the, 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 that reduce the, the, the offense of murder uh, to 
manslaughter. But for today, that is it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.